Uh, good morning, Dr. R. Michael Fisher, educator, philosopher, researcher, and fearologist. Um, I'm involved in political activism as well. Um, this may or may not be the most familiar part that people know about me and my work. But let me explain today, um, this video is all about um, how I approach political activism and how I find the work of Marianne Williamson, um, who is now possibly running again for second term uh, or second possibility really to become a democratic leader or she may go independent in the United States of America for the presidency of the United States in 2024. No small position, no small project, no small aim of an individual and of course the team and the network and the community that she can build, build around her leadership to move forward. Why do I care, care about Marion Williamson is basically because I care about the relationship that I think she focuses on in a very deep, deep and depth way called really the battle of love and fear, if you wanna put it that way. Although I'm going to nuance that conversation because as you may or may not know, my research has been on fear and fearlessness related to love for 33 years. So just to kick things off, get us started, I just was watching um, in the last few days, several talks that she's being interviewed quite heavily again, as the 2022 by-elections in the United States are building up. Now, this is a very important time for electing those new leaders uh, or old leaders who are going to be the representatives as we run for the 2024 election. Even though I'm not an American, I'm a Canadian, I pretty much believe that anything that happens in the United States politically, economically, or otherwise, culturally, is going to affect and impact Canada, where I live and was born and raised. So it's really an internationalist perspective I take on my political activism. So this depth that I'm drilling down to, as you may put it in those words, on love and fear and their combination as a dynamic for motivation. I was so keen about it that I decided to put a book together, which was really came out in 2021 because uh, I thought if I can get this book out before Marian Williamson perhaps even gets to the electorate uh, and could possibly win the democratic leadership and go into debate with then uh, incumbent you know, Donald Trump, I thought, wow, this could be quite a, an interesting, and not just interesting, historically unprecedented debate. And it's not that that's what politics is about, is the debate on stage under the media and the lights, but that is a very important part of what viewers remember historically for a long time. However, Marion Williamson did not get to the leadership uh, shouldn't get past the primaries very far and had to drop out. <clears throat> and of course, now uh, we have a, a new president who is Joe Biden, who became that Democratic leader uh, to be president. So uh, I invite you to think about uh, if you're interested in how I approach political activism. Uh, this book is a good start. Um, I would like to just read very briefly a few of the contents in the book. It's a book still, I must say, unfortunately, unheard of by pretty much everybody, even though I pushed and promoted this book extensively in that 2021 years to try and get it to have the attention it would need um, even before the election of 2020. So even in 2019, I was pushing it. And it was so hard to get reporters or anybody, Mary Williamson herself, to actually attend to this. Now, also, that just reminds me to remind you, if you want more on my background, because this is going to be a video a lot about Mary Williamson today, I have, I think, five or six videos. I've published five or six publications online. Um, I've done YouTube videos and so on. So 
um, Marion Williamson is not just a person. She is representing to me uh, a leadership for the 21st century. And that is a leadership that when she talks about love and fear is so central. And I'll get to the, her notion of a miracle and how that's defined for her politically and spiritually, etc. I just wanted to say that lots of material out there uh, on Marianne Williamson for many people, but I have definitely been her strongest, systematic, probably most scholarly critic and that means both the positive and the not so positive sides of her work and her campaign. And as I said, look for her in 2024. I think I say on the back of the book, the most important national election in US history is underway. Marion Williamson stepped up to show she is confident to be president of the United States in 2020. She has had had to step down. Many people are supportive of her provocative healing vision for America. And that fan and voter base is growing. I believe that is absolutely true. Uh, just looking at the number of interviews she's already getting in 2022, um, she is going to be an item again. And I just, one more sentence, she may run again in 2024. And I do note in the book, there's so much misunderstanding of her and her work, her philosophy, her politics, et cetera. And there's also some good understanding of her work in the public sphere, uh, especially with her running in that election. But she was in politics even back to 2015 uh, in California, running for a position which she didn't win as well. I think that was a, at a congressman's level or perhaps a senator, I can't remember. But the point of this book was really to look at the phenomenon of her running and the Donald Trump phenomenon in contrast, and then how people interpret it different ways. So, but one of the things that I said at the beginning uh, in the introduction, um, I have a section called Transformer for President, not just a reformer, right? We often think about politics as reformers. Um, these are the people that are movers and shakers, and then there's the people in politics who are not reformers. They like to keep the status quo and maintenance and that's what everything's pretty good. So let's kind of keep it that way. Reformers want to change everything. Let's get back to the basics and reforming education and reforming social laws and order. And you can get various kinds of forms, both on the more left and more right of that political spectrum or even centrist. But I put down in this uh, subtitle for my introduction, a shocking possibility. Would we ever get a politician leader like her and the mass of people to support her to actually win and have a, a great impact on transforming this world, which they would, she would, if that was ever to happen. Uh, I'm not a big fan of winning and losing. That's not my focus. I think the mission is much greater than that. And so I did put down uh, for underneath the second topic under the introduction called politician or not. And that was really a confrontation with what is an inevitable question? Why does someone run for president in the United States? Could be a leadership position of any you know, powerful position anywhere in any country by any person. We do have to ask, what is the motivation? Well, because she doesn't have a political track record, um, she, Marianne Williamson, really was out to speak her voice. Speaking truths to power, that kind of social justice activism part that is such a big part of her ministry. And I say ministry very carefully because since 1983, her career took on a ministry. Uh, in the spirituality based upon A Course in Miracles and many other readings, philosophy that she studied prior to discovering that book and her just experience with her father as a very political activist person and so on. A long story, you can read about that in my book and or any other works on Marion Williamson's biography. Not that there is a lot, there's one that I know of other than my own. So, but I was curious of that. And I think Marianne Williamson does not come across as a politician nor say, I wanna be a politician. No, she doesn't do that. 
Um, I think it's one of the problems with her campaign and why she didn't do as successful as she would. I'm not sure she's going to do that again if she runs for 2024. And right now she's just saying, I'm thinking about it when she's asked the question in an interview. But politician or not is an interesting issue because I would say she's out on a mission, which is totally fine for me. If she wants to run in politics and do her mission, go for it. Yeah. Um, it is a ministry of love and miracles. So if I was to summarize it, I say that because why my interest as a fearologist in her work is she defines miracle very clearly as the movement from fear to love. A movement that really is a transformation. Some people might call it transmutation from fear to love. And that means kind of a fear-based notion, not just a feeling of fear, but a fear-based construction of reality. In other words, how our mind puts a lens on reality. Is it a fear-based lens? Is it a love-based lens? And that shift from that fear-based lens to a love-based lens is her definition of miracle. She writes it very clear as the definition in her teachings of A Course in Miracle. And I'm not going to give background on that book and that tradition. You can look that up online. But it's a really important spiritual philosophy for probably what we might call the new age or less you know, controversial term. It's for the 21st century. It's a psycho, political, cultural text with this very powerful, you know, spiritual wisdom, I would agree, universally, this love being so important, fear being probably the energy or the opposite, but in a way they're complementary. And in that sense, the definition she gives in the Course in Miracles gives of this miracle, she, this is her core teaching we can have a miracle in the united states and as a political or a spiritual leader whoever you are you don't have to be any of those labels she says we all are part of that transformation shift fear-based to love-based that will change our world making it all the good things that social justice activists want all the things that spiritual leaders mostly want and so on and that would be a world based on love, just the simple language, peace, justice, liberty, etc. All the good things in the American Constitution, Mary Williams would say, and she regularly cites the founding fathers, leaders of the Constitution, not saying that they're all idealist and perfect in the way they constructed their lives, their leadership, and the Constitution, but she says they knew what we needed to do here in the new world. Um, we saw the destruction in Europe in the old world and the corruption, and they wanted something different coming here. Great, fantastic. So that's what Marianne Williamson aligns herself. So she's radical in a certain way, but she's very centrist in another way, I would say, um, even though she's quite a leftist as well, um, it's hard to put her in a box and that's fine because she's a very rich thinker. I don't need to have her just be liberal um, or not. Um, I don't need to have her in those opposite categories because she's really a continuous thinker. What's the best, she would say. And she often preaches, teaches this in her political speeches and other ways. And so, I'm thinking of what is she going to do different, right? So I've done this book. Um, didn't get a lot of response. Maybe it'll get more attention in this next election spin. And I'm promoting it here, obviously, um, as we move 22 to 24. Um, I'm basically saying, Marianne, please read the book. And all your people read the book my book, and others interested in investigating Marianne Williamson as this potential leader, possibly to get your vote in 2024, if you're American. And or otherwise, if you're not American, that's fine. You can support her still by all the many ways of accessing her websites, donating funds to her campaign, if you believe 
this is the leader and the kind of person that we want. And I would certainly put her in a leadership pers uh, position of the American society, culture, future history. And really it would be a, such a symbol for the world that we deserve and can have, as she would say, this new possibility, this politics of love, quoting from her last title of her last book. So that's a little bit of a spin and an intro to what in my book is really a critique saying this is the best part I think of watching that presidential phenomenon of Marion Williamson. Remember, she's not the only one participating in the creation of that phenomenon because the whole society, the media, the pundits, everybody who's constructing around Marion Williamson running in that kind of leadership position, they're constructing the phenomenon. Similarly with Donald Trump or any other leader, it's a social, cultural, political, economic complex of forces that align and or disalign and even rebel against certain kinds of leaders and what they stand for. Okay, that in mind, the phenomenon being more than her personality, Regardless, there still is a leader who is a spokesperson often for a particular movement. And she would say she is part of this movement. Call it a revolution of love, a politics of a revolution. She will not be afraid to use that word. Revolutions have been important throughout American politics, she says. And of course, every other nation that goes through these major changes, right? These transformations, these reformations, etc. But what makes her unique is the concentration in, on fear and love as being these psychological, cultural, spiritual motivating patterns, right? lenses. So I'm looking at last night, as I watched a couple of the videos, probably about four or five of her speeches, blog interviews she was doing with other people and several people interviewing her for two hours, I'm listening away to see, okay, what's different? See, my book was all about Marianne, this is what we can learn and with Marianne and all her people and anybody. What can we learn from that phenomenon that happened? Marianne Williamson crossed the stage, this phenomenon of presidential candidacy, how it was handled, how it was resisted, what were the mistakes? What were the weaknesses? What were the strengths? So that's what my book assesses. Why people don't want to look at that, I don't know. I really don't know why. It just may take a couple of years. Maybe it takes five years, four years. I don't know for this book that I've put together to be read and synthesized because that's what it is. But so far, I can't seem to get a lot of attention. I think that will change. So what's different? I'm watching, here's the interviews going on. Nah, I'm not hearing anything different. She may not care about that critique. Uh, she may say, oh, I've got all the good foundational material for, for another candidacy. Uh, I'll run again on that same platform. I believe I've got more people and strength behind me. She probably does. But I still say there's still lessons to learn. And that's what an educator does. That's the part of me. She's an educator too. I often claim she's a really good populist adult educator. We have to learn from what we synthesize in the data. So I'm asking her and others again to assess what do we do different this time? Well, so far, as I say, I'm not hearing anything different. Okay, why? Hmm going to go with what is comfortable for her, what worked last time. Um, she can give these speeches, talks on any topic around politics in America, pretty much. And she's got it down. She's, she's rehearsed this stuff. She's, she's delivered it hundreds of times. It's like a tape recorder push on deliver. And I'm not saying she doesn't have intelligent capacity and flexibility beyond that. She does but she's going with what 
worked last time. She's going with it so far. Maybe she will eventually pull out something new and creative. I haven't seen that yet in her talks. I'm not hearing it. But what I did hear, one big difference. And it may not be significant at this point. It's still pretty early in the run. Uh, obviously, we're only barely halfway into the next cycle for the American presidency election. But what I did not hear is in the two hours was her use of the word fear. Okay, that's significant. Um, as I said, fear is the other half of her definition of a miracle. She did use the word miracle a few times in interviews, you know, because American interviewers, some of the political activists that were interviewing her on these podcasts and so on, you know, they're apathetic. People don't want to vote. She's saying, oh, well, we still can have a miracle. Yeah, but it's impossible to get someone like you into the, no. There's a miracle. She always leaves room for a miracle. And I think that's great. I think that's what a visionary does, what a prophetic person does. And again, she's not wildly prophetic, although definitely comes from a prophetic tradition of ministry and education, and now is bringing into politics more and more, even though she's been in politics with a political flair since she was back in the 80s and earlier. So it's not new to her, but why was fear not used? So that's a question mark I'm putting on my sort of notepad. And we'll do that right now with you and doing it in public as a voice to say, well, okay, well, Marianne, when are you going to start talking about fear? It's not, again, just Marianne. It's everything that surrounds her system of supports and oppositions. It doesn't matter because they're all part of this phenomenon that she's pushing this love agenda into, as other great leaders have, MLK and Mahatma Gandhi and others. But we now have a woman, yes, indeed, woman identified. That makes a difference. Lots of things make a difference in how she's doing it and who she is, et cetera, which is an important image, as I said, an icon, a mythic symbol, really, for a new kind of America, a new kind of world. Not fear? Okay, so if you're not using fear, she's just going to talk politics. She will bring up love, but I noticed she didn't actually bring up love a lot. Um, the people who brought it up were the interviewees, the viewers. Interesting. So is she, this is my question, is she going to kind of avoid this time around in her run? getting into all the love and fear stuff, conversation, um, perhaps being then seen as too new agey, too psychological, too woo woo, uh, which she got criticized in the last election run heavily. Uh, that may be her strategy, right? I mean, it makes sense. She, she's, she might look at, I've already thought through, talked to some of her people, and they said, you know, don't forefront that so much this time. Let's Let's come across really politically sound. And she's good at that. She, you know, she does her good political homework for the most part, is that I can tell. And she can come across, she's a great you know, orator. And that should be good enough. You know, let people make their decision, but at least she'll be out there giving the alternative voice. And again, I say it's her, her ministry voice. So um, she might come out with miracle. She may never use the word miracle once she kind of gets in there further, but she might. But why not love and fear? And so as a fearologist, I cannot help to actually keep pushing on this. Um, we have to talk about love and fear. Okay, so why do we have to do that, Dr. Fisher? <laughs> Many reasons. Look at my 120 yeah, YouTubes or you know hundreds of publications I have online and books, over 11 books now, I think. Um, I do talk about why it's important to have fear and love talks, um, but particularly, particularly, I have a series of talks, uh, I think I have 16 of them now called Fear Talks. I encourage you to check them out on my YouTube channel here. Um, most up-to-date, and this is what I would love Marianne Williamson and people that are interested in connecting and supporting her and her leadership, that they look at really understanding fear in some new ways and creative ways. So 
she had a strong sense of speaking about fear and how she did it in the last election. I'm not complaining about that per se. Um, I still think it's still not informed at a 21st century level, which she keeps saying, we, we got to come to the 21st century paradigm. Well, I don't think she's there yet. I've argued this before uh, in her understanding of fear and the dynamic of wealth. She's, she's got some really great basics, but to me has not upgraded that to a 21st century paradigm thinking, and especially to my work, uh, obviously, and others. So um, a new foundation and a new exciting discovery I want to share with you before I end the video is um, a new author, Samuel Julian, um, 19, born 1939, died in 26, um, a good brother of the soul. And as far as I'm concerned, I had contact with him between 2004, 2005 on emails when those books came out. This one came out in 2002. Um, his next book, Terrified by Education, came out in 2005. Very odd titles, as you will notice. Um, he's promoting fear at this very strong, almost, really? Samuel, you're saying fear is is everything we should be terrified we should be terrifying our children well he defines terrify in a very careful way and he is talking about good terror not excessive harmful pathological terror same with the word fear replace it with terror but he, he's not afraid to use the word terror and there's a reason because he's a Beckerian. ernest becker's work terror management theory work he was aware of that in his studies, um, but it's really this message here, how to positively enjoy being afraid is really his core philosophy. Really two interesting books. He only wrote two in his life, but he was a school teacher in New York City in the Bronx, African-American thinker, teacher, stunning work on making certainly me and others who are interested in this study of fear at this expanding imaginary of a 21st century perspective we have a lot to learn and think about and i'm just recommending him right now samuel jillian's work and while I'll be writing a book i'm proposing it right now uh, an intellectual biography on his life there will be an intro intellectual biography like I did on Marion Williamson, etc. So all of that, I'm basically saying, and if Jillian, Sam, Jillian was to, around today, and if he's listening to this podcast, being present with us today, um, may we refocus and think very carefully about this strategy that Marion Williamson may be getting involved in, uh, looks to be of not talking about the word fear. And it's not just the word, but it's the concept and the conceptualization, the imaginary and the depth of analysis. And certainly from Sam Gillian, as I'm reading him very carefully these days, we have to do that fear talk. We have to admit deeply and carefully thoughtfully and fearfully in a good way to go right into the center core of understanding the nature and role of fear in all of human behavior and in the very evolution of humanity we have to do this he says because any other attempt right that skirts around or avoids using even the word fear, as I'm concerned, as I'm expressing in this video, uh, Mary Williamson might get into for political reasons, to be successful in her mind, etc. cetera, uh, will probably be uh, a huge error. That's the point of this video today. I uh, appreciate you taking it in. I often argue that um, let's add the trialectic Fear, love moving in this dialectic relationship, each required for understanding this miracle. Marion Williamson, the Course in Miracles, talks about this transformation, transmutation, fear to love, energy, motivations. 
not making fear bad. And that Jillian is clear about that. He calls it the beauty of fear. So you know he's not a fear negativist. But I've added a third dimension, which Jillian does not speak about and would actually wrote to me and said, Mikey, I'll get rid of all that fearless, fearlessness stuff. Yeah, right, Jillian. I just spent 25 years, you know, studying fearlessness with fear and so on. And, and that's what he was trying to get me to you know, drop it. It's just, it's insane. It's impossible. It's not what's going on. That's not who we are. We're, we're fear um, conditioned so deeply. And there's a good side to that. And yes, there's a bad side to that. So him and I agreed on the, the bad side, but we, we didn't totally agree on um, how to approach fear in the sense that I approached it from a fearlessness perspective. And that's a debatable issue, of course, and uh, I'll be continuing writing on that. And this notion of should we be more fear positive, more fear negative? Uh, fearlessness is not meant to be fear negative, but it sounds like it is fear negative, right? Fear less, have less of that fear, sounds negative. Um, I think that's a superficial reading of it, but there is something to it. I'm not denying that. I have a very strong, not anti, but I have a very strong criticism of fear in the construction of its form, not fear. And you know, that's going to help us be aware and survive from dangers. That's a very, we could just call that intelligent awareness and defense. I need to call it fear, but we do call it fear um, for the most part. I'm talking about a culturally constructed, politically constructed fear. Marion Williamson doesn't do that per se either, and The Course in Miracles does not do that either. So again, this is where there's some challenge between their discourses uh, of fear and mine. Now that aside, I would just like to say, get involved political activism in your own way. That's my thought for the day. It's for my encouragement for the day. And it's to myself to remind myself that it's a long journey, but it's worth participating in. Uh, it's the way I like to come into politics. I'm not interested in debating a lot of the other issues. I think this is the love-fear dynamic is so core to human behavior if we don't get that straight if we do not get this really good fear education that jillian and myself and others interested in this fear work if we don't get that piece down so core into our curriculum as a society as a world i believe we will still be scrambling our politics will still be often insane and producing insane results. And we don't have a lot of time left on the planet, as many people have said, at least as our species, as we know it, living the kind of life that we know it. Um, the crises and dangers are obviously so near. And so am I terrified? Yeah, I'm terrified of all of that phenomenon. Do I run my life by being terrified? No. I run it based on what I call the path of fearlessness. And that's traveling in and out of this fear matrix and always with love at the foundation, knowing that this love and fear miraculous transmutation of energies, we can move into a very positive force, change and evolution consciousness with fear, moving into love, which will then move back into fear, back into love. They're not against each other in that way. And again, I'm simplifying that because there is a very toxic cultural modified form of fear that I pursue and persist in creating understanding of and to help societies, help perhaps leaders like Mary Williamson to consider um, we need to also look at that form. Here. It's a very different beast, so to speak. Anyways, thanks for listening today. 
Carmichael Fisher. Have a good day.